So our final speaker of this session is Vishwajit Kumar. He, he literally arrived last night from India uh, for this occasion. Uh, for this talk, uh, we're really now broadening our perspective to uh, more global. Um, Vishwajit Kumar is a physician. Uh, he trained in the state of Bihar, and people from Bihar are known for being very smart, creative, uh, but often leaving and having impact elsewhere, out, outside where they came from. Uh, he's different. Uh, Viswaji went uh, on to public health training at Johns Hopkins. Uh, that's where he and I got to know each other. Uh, he then decided to take his public health training and go back essentially to the epicenter of public health. I think maybe some of you have heard me say this before, but if you think about just about anything bad that happens in public health around the world, about 25% of it happens in India. And he decided to go right back um, to actually the, the poorest, uh, most populous state in India with the poorest health outcomes uh, and took on the challenge that if he could make things happen there, uh, could make it happen anywhere, and that we would learn things that would translate into impact around the world. So he began to focus on understanding communities and understanding how to interact with them in a way that you could effectively bring science into their culture in a way that they would adopt it and in a way that you could achieve maximal impact. He's engaged in a variety of, of evidence-based studies to, to uh, bring science to these issues, and the science has gone on to influence the WHO, for example, in, in a number of their policies around uh, maternal newborn child care uh, throughout the world. Uh, Dr. Kumar um, has formed with his wife uh, the Community Empowerment Lab, which is dedicated to these principles and this work within India, has several uh, trials currently going on uh, trying to get at the, the root causes of poverty and poor health and looking increasingly at how you translate from good health into child, into child thrival and trying to understand from the community's perspective how do they think about thrival, how do they think about nurturing children, and how do we bring science to bear upon these issues? So, Viswajit, thank you for joining us all the way from India. Thank you very much. Uh, I bring greetings from 1.2 billion people, um, very far away, and, uh, and from a land very, very unfamiliar to many, actually, particularly at least in the region that I work. And so, uh, thank you, Gary, so, thank you so much for this generous introduction. And uh, I don't have any slides, but for uh, what you might expect from me is, is a villager who just happens to speak in English. And so, uh, you know, and, and I think it's very important, and I'm truly honored to be here, to interact with some of the smartest people on this planet. In a geography, that has impact in every village on this planet, and so in Uttar Pradesh as well. And I think that's one of the reasons why it makes this interaction extremely important and special. I work in an organization known as Community Empowerment Lab, but I think I would phrase it and say it is Communities Empowerment Lab. And therefore, my primary objective and goal is to work with them work on their behalf, and then reach out to people like you to see if we can actually forge a collaboration and join forces so that we can actually make some real impact in the real world. You know, some of the most fascinating advances that we have had in public health has, and one, one example that crops up is vaccines. And we all agree, and Gary has started with that example. We have wiped smallpox off the map of this planet. We are actually close to doing that for polio. And I remember when India was declared polio-free last year, there was huge celebrations across multiple cities in the country. But unfortunately, I did not read a single story where the community actually celebrated that they are polio-free. And so that begs a serious question. So this whole paradigm where you have some incredibly smart people who develop these incredible technologies, which are then transported 
all across the world, and they have real impact. And, and it has real impact, and it has also inspired a whole new generation of attempts to see how we can actually have these innovations from, say, the Silicon Valley, and see how we can actually take them through the vaccine route to people. We have had mixed response and reaction, and I think there has been a mixed adoption. And, uh, and we continue to struggle, and therefore, we either tend to see the community as a black box, or we tend to see the community as a blank box. And the black box, because we just don't understand who they are. What did they do? Their cultures, their practices, their beliefs, their mythologies. It's so distinct and so different from the way we have been brought up with. Or it's a blank box. We just don't care. We simply have to tell them what to do because we believe they are knowledge deficient, information deficient, and all that is needed is to tell them what to do. Unfortunately, both of these have had not great impact. I started working in child survival almost 12 years back with Gary. And, and I think it was a very fundamental question that we wanted to ask. Because when we looked at the data, we knew right in 2003 that breastfeeding was natural, available to everyone, but yet its adoption was so low. Even today, as I speak in the state of Uttar Pradesh, that is the epicenter of global health challenges, you cannot meet the Millennium Development Goals without UP, and you did not meet it because of UP. And, this, and, the, and the SDGs, I believe, will have the same fate. And so, I think it was important for us to say, why not? We know what works. We somehow don't know how to make it work. And therefore, we have most of the interventions, even in the field of child survival, which are even remotely behavioral in nature, have actually faced these kind of challenges and have had difficulty in actually achieving impact. We have made some huge strides. We have, on an average, of clocked 4% annual reduction in child mortality year on year. That 4%. Looks good, but if we actually control for increased uh, economic gains, that per capita income in these countries, we actually control for increased communication, increased education for the women, I believe that percentage is actually going to go down. We can do more. I think we can definitely applaud ourselves for what we have been able to achieve, but we can do far more than we have been able to. And so we started to say, maybe there is another way that we can try to engage and understand this problem. Do we necessarily have to see people as problems that we want to solve? Do we necessarily want to see people as, as passive consumers who have to demand certain services from us? And we are the omnipotent, all-powerful suppliers of these solutions. Was there another way that we could actually engage and understand? So we started this journey in 2003, and we said, let's try to unlock the black box and see how black it is. It wasn't black. It was colorful. It did appear at the surface that it was dark. The traditions were medieval. And so I'll give you an example. When we started looking at survival, and as many of you would know, majority of deaths, almost 35% of those deaths, are actually because of newborn infection. Another quarter to asphyxia, and the last quarter to complications of prematurity. When we actually went back and tried to look at what the community actually believes, what is baby die of? And you know what they said? Can anybody guess? They said, it's a ghost. It's, there are only two major causes of mortality and morbidity. For mortality, that was the evil spirit that was lurking out there, and that would actually come and kill the baby. And then you had the evil eye, which actually was, you know, 
envious friends who would actually cast on my child and my baby would get sick. And so you go deeper and then you realize, oh, actually just like you have these perinatal intensive care units, they have developed their own domiciliary intensive care units. They confine the mother and the baby for, for seven days at least, where only few people are actually invited in. It is the lowest caste woman, untouchable, because so that she can come in, clean the cord, scrape the skin really hard, because it's dirty. And therefore, you need somebody in the entire caste structure who actually can do the dirtiest work. So she comes in, cleanses the baby, goes away, and then somebody else from a next hierarchy, which is the masseuse, she comes in to massage the baby for the next few days and the mother. And then you have the village priest who actually comes in and tells you that, oh, actually I have seen the Janam Patri, a horoscope of the baby, and, and actually the best day to start feeding would be the third day. It's bizarre. Even as I speak, it just didn't happen 12 years back. It happens as I speak. And so, and then you have all of these strewn together and, and then they are confined. But interestingly, if we actually look at the epidemiology of neonatal mortality, we actually realize that the first seven days are indeed the most vulnerable period. Majority of newborns actually die in the first week. So they did have some sense of vulnerability. They had a cause structure. And in order to achieve that cause, they had actually confined the mother and the baby in a room, no care seeking outside because there is that evil spirit lurking outside, which if they actually go out, could actually be harmed. And they put the baby at risk. And therefore, if the baby is indeed unwell, which they perceive it to be, then they need to go to a healer who can actually do it. Now, it is something that it just violates whatever we know about, about medicine, about newborn health, about its cause, how we can, how we can solve it. And so for us, it was, we said, is there a way that we can actually bring these two worlds to come and talk to each other? One, which is largely a socio-cultural, traditional cognitive system, a script that has been written for thousands of years and just doesn't show some very significant signs of change. To another, a more Western influence biomedical system. One is logical, the other is just mythical. The one is maybe holistic, the other is very analytical. And can we actually get to talk to each other? When we actually applied the science that we knew onto this, we realized that actually there are ways that we can modify it. We need to leverage. Can we actually leverage the socio-cultural cognitive community systems to make it work for newborns? We had one meeting point, and that was the newborn survival. The mothers did everything, the family did everything, because they wanted to save the life of the baby. That's something that we want to do as a global community. So that was one alignment of goals. And the next, we realized that it was important that we needed to create some white space, which management gurus would call it a blue ocean strategy. Can we just create something that does not challenge their existing beliefs, but can actually atrophy those channels and create new pathways? So we created a component. We actually introduced the whole concept of hypothermia. We used the term Tanda Bukhar. Interestingly, hypothermia did not exist in their whole setting, in their vocabulary. By creating this, and why we created, because almost every risk factors that put the baby at increased risk of infection was also putting the baby at increased, well, of, of hypothermia was putting the babies at increased risk of infection but there was a fundamental difference between hypothermia and what they considered to be caused by this evil spirit. The evil spirit they had no control over. They were afraid of. 
It was the dark force that could come and kill. Hypothermia, on the other hand, was something that they could detect through a thermometer by touch. Hypothermia was something that they could actually do something about. They could prevent. They could actually put the baby on a skin-to-skin -skin care and we actually see an improvement. We were just simply created something, a white space that they could start relating to and start helping interactions and start designing interactions. Those interactions were not just saying, you need to do this, because we did not believe that they were blank boxes, but they were colored boxes, colorful, coded. And so we wanted to reason with them. We realized it's an oral culture. People talk in stories. And therefore, I don't have slides. I said, let me just tell you a story. And so we used analogies as a shortcut to the brain. So for example, you would say, and then I believe Gary did mention it last time, how do you talk to them about the importance of skin-to-skin -skin care? Many of them keep hands, which incubates the egg, and the lifeless, lifeless egg actually just comes out, a live chicken. They know that incubation helps, and mother can be a powerful incubator. So we used analogies to drive that reasoning paradigm. And it worked. The second, it was important for them that they needed to experience evidence. Why wouldn't they do what they were doing before? One of the beliefs that they had was the mother could not breastfeed her baby on the first day. There just wouldn't be any milk let down at all. That's what they were told by the priest. When they actually put the baby on a skin to skin, and the baby latched, and there was a milk let down. They thought it was a miracle. They wanted to experience the benefits, to believe it. Once they start experiencing the benefit, then they need to have the capability to do it. Most of them have very low self-efficacy. Unlike the Western paradigm, you, can, you feel you can, an individual is powerful. An individual can conquer the world. An individual is born once, and whatever you need to achieve, you do it in this lifetime. Look at that woman. She thinks she's a small speck. She's just a small speck in the entire universe, and everyone is in control except her. She has been what is what she is today if she was born in a lower caste is because of what she did in her previous life. So she literally has no control, and therefore she has to defer to people who can make more sense of that complexity. And therefore it's a deeply hierarchical, deeply inequitable society. So we need to create enabling environment where she can actually help shift from what she was doing to something else. An enabling environment would also mean it was not just the mother who was doing it, but she wanted to be sure that the community was supporting it. And therefore, shifting the community norms was very critical, an important multiplier of behavior change. And therefore, it was, we had to embed certain things in their community ecology. For example, they sing songs. Women come together and they sing. We wanted to embed these key practices and key messages within these. It led to a, a 54% reduction in neonatal mortality. We did a randomized control trial over 18 months. Essentially, what the community achieved was more than a tenfold reduction in neonatal mortality than what the government was able to achieve. That was dramatic. But more importantly, I think it was not just the, we need to expand what the community meant. The community meant the women, the village elders, the untouchable woman, the priest, and the community of scientists like you. These two people, these two cultures came together to unify around, respect each other, interact with each other, and co-create something that actually enabled them to reduce neonatal mortality 10 times faster 
than we have known in that country. And so I, I, I you know, and, and that was, and more, and when we actually, because it's a surveillance site, we do a two monthly surveillance of every families. When we actually looked at other indicators, we were surprised to see a lot of other emergent effects. We found maternal mortality had come down by 34%, statistically insignificant simply because, you know, small numbers. We also found that the care-seeking behavior for the girl child had improved to equal that of a male child. And more importantly, the discrimination of the lowest caste had dramatically reduced. What we actually realized that, unlike a gentamicin or unlike a vaccine, if we were to actually design this together, bring the best of both these cultures in a respectful engagement, we just don't have the power to reduce neonatal mortality, but we also become a tool for social transformation. But then, you know, we are trialists. Day 29, we record the neonatal mortality. My job is done. We need to work on a manuscript, submit it to the lances of the world, and wait for our reward. We had a community meeting, and I hope Gary remembers, there was this old lady who comes in and says, you know, you, you know, the program actually saved a lot of lives. We know that but you need to be thinking about the brains of our children. And there is another gentleman in this room, or maybe he is, but the next, the plenary speaker, um, Peter Singer. He was, they launched the Grand Challenges Canada, and that gave us the opportunity to start thinking of thrival, and I'll tell you why they use the word thrival. And so, the next question for us is, should we, and here to this audience, I don't have to tell you, the whole, how powerful these thousand days is for the child. We know that during pregnancy in the first two years, phenomenal, powerful. Should we simply use what we know and what we did for mortality and just apply that for child development and early childhood development interventions? And will it work? We said, before we do that, let's again rewind and do what we did before. Let's talk to the community and listen to them. And so we started the journey to listen to our community. We realized two things came up. Very important and at the surface seems unrelated to early childhood development. One was the fear of survival. When the fear of survival, even as I speak in the region that I work, 10% of births either end up as a neonatal death or as a stillbirth. Now, when you have that one in 10 chance, the maternal mortality is amongst the highest in the world with over 450 for 100,000 mothers. Now, when you have that fear of death staring at you, you're paralyzed. When you're pregnant, you're not thinking of development. You're thinking of yourself. You're not sure, as I speak, my wife, Arti, and the co-founder of this organization, she's pregnant. And I can tell you it's my fear too, because we don't have a Stanford medicine there. And so, at that point, this perpetual fear that they find defines what they do. And therefore, till we do not address survival together with early childhood development, those transformation in behaviors is not going to take place. And the second is more fundamental, and that's the position of women. So let me go back and I say why the position of women in Indian society is so critical intervention for early childhood development, and so fundamental. So let's go back quickly, and I say this girl is born. She is born today, and when she is born a girl, the hospital that she delivered in, the nurse who delivered her actually charges less money as a bride. If it were a boy, she would take a thousand rupees. If it's a girl, she could even let it go. And so that's the point that she begins her journey. She's a liability. 
Very recently, one of the members of parliament, of Indian parliament, actually wrote on his election sheet that in his liability, he said, I have a daughter. That's how she begins her journey. She is not trained and culturated to actually play and grow up as an individual with her own dreams. But she is trained to play a social role of a woman who's going to serve the sexual needs of her husband, as a woman who has to procreate so that she can take the, the, the lineage forward, and that can only be done through a boy. And third, she has to fulfill her social role of taking care of the family and the in-laws. That's how she begins her journey. She's trained. While the boy can play, she has to help with the family chores. She grows up. Before she enters, her marriage is not decided by her, but is imposed on her. She gets married into a family, and that is a rebirth. A woman is considered, in the society that I work, she is considered to be somebody who is on a loan, who has to be, is a liability who has to be transferred. But it doesn't go, she just doesn't get married. Her family has to pay a dowry for her marriage, which essentially commoditifies her. She goes, gets married to a family, and she has one big challenge. She has to prove that she is fertile. If she does not, she faces social ostracism. And the guy faces some, some social rebuke. And so it is very important for her that she actually becomes pregnant. But when she becomes pregnant, on the first three months, she doesn't want to even talk about it. And her mother-in-law is the person who actually decides everything. She's now in a new family, and she needs to decide, and she needs to conform to the new rules. And her mother is the guardian of tradition. She needs to ensure that what she has inherited, that is what she's going to pass it on. And so the first three months just passes by, and they don't even register. They don't receive your essential folic acid, etc. The second trimester, she knows that she is pregnant. But then she's nervous. She still doesn't think that the baby has life. She thinks the baby has life only at the end of five or the fifth or the sixth month. If she is her second or a third pregnancy or a fourth pregnancy, you will be stunned to know that for many, abortion is a contraception of choice. And so she goes in, she does not have any reproductive choices, by the way. The husband will not use himself, and neither will he allow her to use. In fact, in India, you have far more tubectomy than you have vasectomy. And so then she goes in, and almost 80% of them are anemic while she's pregnant. Now that's what she got, gets into pregnancy. She does not know anything about it. In the last trimester of pregnancy, she starts to feed less because she's afraid that the baby now which is throbbing, if that baby grows too large, it may actually risk her delivery. And therefore she starts eating less. We already, when she delivers, we talked about that. After the baby has been born and after they have survived the survival, the valley of death, the baby still does not graduate to be a full human. For almost the next two years, the baby is still almost, there is a detached relationship with the mother and the family with the baby. And I believe that's more a response to higher mortality, but they just want to engage and see if it can actually, the baby will survive. They do not believe that there is something like an active brain. There is something that you can actually, you, you can actually interact with the baby's mind and help it develop more, more robust architecture. It doesn't exist in her entire. They believe it is simply automatic manifestations and people will emerge as it does. It only opens up in terms of the capabilities only when they start going to school. And so this is unlike survival where they were hardwired, they had some rules in terms of thriving, literally nothing exists. 
but we need to therefore, there is a whole new opportunity that we need to create. And that opportunity is about the power of dreams. We created hypothermia for survival. And here, we felt that we could create the power of dreams. One thing that we talked to mothers, and we said, when you got married and came here, can you tell me what dreams you had? And there's a lady, she looked at a, a bird and she said, I wanted to be like a bird. But now, when you get married, you have to let go of everything. He said, how about if, we can, if you think your child can actually start to dream, your child can actually fly, and her eyes would just light up. And so we realized that if they have to move from survival to thrival, they need to let go of the fear and bring in a whole new force of dreams. So instead of the health worker who manage their behavior in our survival study, we propose that here we need to have life coaches that you have just like you have for your basketball teams. Can they actually help them and get them overcome this? The third was innovations. What kind of innovations do we actually need to bring? Well, some innovations that can unify, innovations that can empower. I'll give an example of massage. Every baby in the community is massaged with, with mustard oil and massaged very vigorously. Can we actually change that? And there is a whole woman, a caste, which actually is dedicated to doing this. Can we actually tweak it, re-engineer that to make it more gentle, more interactive, change the oil to more safer, maybe sunflower seed oil, and then begin this whole dance of interaction and get them out of it. These are many possibilities that are out there. But for that, it's important that communities like you have to actually not consider these communities that I stay in as black boxes, but communities that are willing to engage with you, to interact with you, so that we can actually break those boundaries, so that every child is born with, with uh, every child, we know that every child has the power and the right to dream, and we have the ability together to make the dream a possibility. Thank you very much, and I'm honored to be here again. Thank you. Ishuji, thank you for these very powerful words and, and fantastic illustration of, of the differences that exist in a place like India, for example, and, and the importance of understanding these, these fundamental paradigms and, and beliefs and connecting with the people and engaging with the people in a way that enables you to enter into, an, into a dialogue that leads to change. So thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to have to move right on uh, to, to our uh, keynote speaker. Uh, Vishwajit will be around afterwards, so grab him at the lunch. Thank You'll you. learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you.